Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Minnehaha County Historical Society, the South Dakota Military Heritage Alliance, and old guys in their airplanes, please welcome aviation artist, historian, and award-winning filmmaker, John Mollison. Thank you very much. Love hearing the applause. Rick has told me that I need to be uh, staying here because this is where the camera is going to be focusing on me. Look at that. Ah! Look, I am not the star. But I want to explain something tonight. This is such a rare moment for all of you to experience. Because tonight, you get to see what Rick Lindberg and I get to do as part of the old guys in the airplanes crew. And that is meet history face to face. My name is John Mollison. And if we jumped into an elevator together, I'd tell you, I interview old guys and I draw their airplanes. But it is so much more than that. The work that I've been doing for the past 20 years, 30 years, actually since I was three years old, has taught me so much about this country, about myself, and how I can interact with this great, great land. Amen. Yeah. So I'll tell you what's going to happen tonight. I'm going to attempt to explain the Vietnam War in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't think uh, I can get that done, but I have to ask for a, a raise of hands. How many here remember the Vietnam War? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. Well, we want to clap, but some, some of us want to cry. When I was a little kid, when I was like nothing, what I remember about the Vietnam War is two things. Hang on, excuse me, Rick, we got to come down. It's pretty hot. I remember two things about the Vietnam War. The first thing is that when I would reach up and try to turn the TV off, I couldn't. And the second thing I remember about the Vietnam War is that when I tried to turn the TV off, it was because it would stop the people yelling and screaming at the TV in the house. The Vietnam War to me seemed to make everybody mad. Later on as I grew up and I became kind of a history geek and I got involved in drawing airplanes of actually some of South Dakota's great heroes like George McGovern, Joe Foss, I vowed that the good war, as Studs Terkel, the famous uh, author, wrote about, was going to be the war I was going to write about and draw and record and all that good stuff. I never wanted to be a part of the Vietnam War. But a gentleman in Sioux Falls got me to draw a B-52 bomber. And I remember thinking, okay, I'll do that, and I'll put it on my blog. And it was the first time I ever got hate mail. And it brought me back to that moment uh, when I was a little kid, and I vowed, I don't like what's going on. Well, I have to tell you the truth. Since then, I've been to Vietnam three times. I've lectured in Hanoi. I've made two films over there. And I have never felt prouder to be an American than to be in Hanoi, and I see that we live in a country that right or wrong, good and bad, we can send our precious life to defend an idea that we believe in. So tonight, what I'd like to do is give a short primer on the Vietnam War, but really, I know why we're all here. We're here to learn history like I learn history, and that's been valuable to me, and that is looking somebody in the eye and asking them questions. Tonight, we're going to be able to meet Colonel Robert Certain. Now, we all know we're here about Linebacker 2. Linebacker 2 is important to me because it is the operation that effectively ended the war for the United States and brought the POWs home. Colonel Certain was aboard the first B-52 shot down during linebacker two and made a POW. 
as we talk and as we think, do not think twice about raising your hand and interrupting me so that you can ask a question to Colonel Certain. I am not the star here. Colonel Certain is. So let me try this quick 10 minute, <laughs> see if I can get the Vietnam War uh, in 10 minutes. Now we have a VIP in the audience. He's our South Dakota state historian, Dr. Ben Jones. He's also Colonel Ben Jones, but he's in the back. And I sent him this presentation and I said, Ben, do you think I can talk and teach the Vietnam War at 10 minutes? And it was silence. Please give me a little grace here. All right, Rick, can you call up my PowerPoint? All right, great graphic here. Uh, designed a B-52G model, just like uh, Colonel Certain flew. But we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of the war's end. 50 years ago today, Colonel Certain was in the Hanoi Hilton awaiting going home because he knew that linebacker too. He didn't know, the, know it at the time, but he knew that something happened that would secure his release. So let's, let's get to a real quick overview of the Vietnam War here. Real, uh, oh, wow, this is great. I want a couple caveats with you. The first caveat is this is a fixed wing centric. Now, most people think about Vietnam War and you hear, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, you know, the music and the wop, 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 helicopters. Well, this is, we're going to be talking a lot about fixed wing, Air Force, Navy, Marines, airplanes that aren't helicopters. And you have to understand that even though we're going to be focusing a lot on U.S. Air Force, it involved, linebacker uh, two involved all branches. The second thing is, what I'm going to try to describe really quickly is a historical paintbrush that is wide. In reality, this pres presentation is a one-page bullet point in a long, long tome of stuff. Now, big picture on linebacker two. It brought both the North Vietnamese and the United States to a place to end their hostilities. And it was crucial to the return of the POWs. All right, real quick. Now, this graphic is complicated. I want to let you know that I work with the Distinguished Flying Cross Society. It's the fourth highest award for AVA, or for valor and heroism in flight. And this graphic you can download. If you go to dfcsociety.org and go to educators and teachers, you can see uh, any number of uh, downloads that I've produced for them. And this is actually in Colonel Certain's um, a download kit. We call them educator skits. But I, I, I brought this up for the purpose. The average American seems to think that the Vietnam War happened like in 1969, and that was it. And it was just the United States going into Vietnam to invade or something to that effect. We have to get our head around that the Vietnam War is a long train to run. It. If you look up on the top there, if I can get this little, little uh, gizmo, this little laser that isn't really showing up there. The timeline of notable events in Southeast Asia, and the reason I call it Southeast Asia is because when, when at least the 20th century conflict started, it was September 1940, and we really didn't have a Vietnam. Vietnam wasn't Vietnam. Vietnam was something called French Indochina. And it began when Japan invaded French Indochina, and kept France in power. Now, I'm not gonna go through every step here. This could take us two to three, maybe 20 years. <laughs> I want people to understand that we're talking about a moment right here. January 1973, the Paris Peace Accords ends Vietnam versus US fighting, but the fighting still continued between North and South Vietnam. We went in to help our friends, the South Vietnamese, in their civil war. It wasn't successful to us. But linebacker two brought that moment to an end. So if you want to see this timeline, go to dfcsociety.org, check out educators and teachers tab, and you can see it. But the bottom line is, 
Southeast Asia conflict began long before we got there. Now, moving forward with this idea that fixed wing centric, you really got to get your head around four operations. The first operation is something called Operation Rolling Thunder. And that began in March 65, and it went through November 68. And its basic goals was to support South Vietnamese, the uh, South Vietnam, and destroy North Vietnam's war capacity. Now, we talk about the POWs. The POWs had to come home. They became a bargaining chip in the war. Most of the POWs happened during Operation Rolling Thunder. And it was a bad time to be a POW. The North Vietnamese were not nice. They were cruel. They didn't consider the Geneva Convention, whatever that meant. And I want you to think about something. Ask Colonel Certain about the treatment of the old POWs versus the new POWs, because it'll tell you something about how savvy the North Vietnamese were in negotiating public relations. But you got to understand that up until 1968, we were flying combat into North Vietnam. Then came the bombing halt. Now, at the time, nobody liked the Vietnam War in the United States. Well, I'm sure there were some people who thought it was a good idea, but that was the time when public sentiment said, we're not gonna win this war. It was a dumb thing to get involved. President Johnson decided to make a statement and saying, we're gonna stop bombing the North as a diplomatic effort to bring all the parties to the negotiating table. The bombing halt landed between March 68 and April of 1972. And we all know that the Vietnam War continued on. The bombing halt didn't do much other than allow the North Vietnamese to regroup, supply more, and get ready for more warfare. So then President Nixon came in in 1969, well, when he was inaugurated, and he wanted to make good on the idea that we're going to pull Americans out of Vietnam. Well, I think we all remember what recently happened in Afghanistan. You just don't pull people out. It's a process, and you have to think it through. Well, as part of the process of thinking through how do we get out of Vietnam, President Nixon knew that we have to turn up the heat again. And he resumed flights, American uh, Navy, Air Force, and Marine flights into North Vietnam to stop supplies from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. Remember, North Vietnam and South Vietnam are fighting each other. Did it work? Well, it did. It brought the Vietnamese to the negotiating table because they realized that now the United States was going to use force but then they pulled back again, because remember the North Vietnamese were experts in public relations. And by this time in 1972, they knew how to play the media well. It's amazing. I, I, hats off to them. So in October of 1972, when the North Vietnamese pulled out of the negotiations to end the war and get ourselves, the, at least the United States, out of, out of, the, out of the area, Richard Nixon, President Nixon, and Henry Kessinger recognized that they had been scammed. Let's just call it that. Maybe not literally, but they felt like they were getting ripped off. And they knew, okay, now we've got to end this thing. We've got to show the North Vietnamese that we are committed to engaging in war to bring peace. And that became Operation Linebacker 2, December of 1972. And its basic goal was to send Mike Tyson in and say, we're going to beat the heck out of you until you say no. This is when I was that little kid and I got to see the Vietnam War on TV. But the basic takeaway is Linebacker 2 was the stop to a long line of aerial operations. So let's go through some linebacker two facts here. First of all, it happened December 18th through the 29th in December. It was the largest aerial bombardment campaign since World War II, uh, primarily night bombings against Hanoi and Haiphong military targets. 
and it involved all branches of service. Now, Colonel Certain is U.S. Air Force, but uh, every, everybody played, played a role. In the campaign, 26 U.S. aircraft were lost, and over 1,250 surface-to-air missiles were launched by the North Vietnamese against our aerial operations. That's significant. That's an awful lot of big missiles, big expensive missiles, which of course were provided by the, our Cold War enemies, the Russians and the Chinese. Poor US tactics on opening nights were legendary. You might wanna ask Colonel Certain about this, but I'll tell you real quick. What happened was, was that the, uh, for the first three nights, the Air Force brought in the B-52s to Hanoi in such a way that they're, they came across the target at the same time, the same altitude, the same direction, and made it entirely predictable for the North Vietnamese. Our losses were terrible, but we learned lessons. And by the end of the month, the North Vietnamese had run out of missiles and the United States had run out of targets because we had hit them all. Mostly Linebacker 2 is remembered for its use of B-52 bombers, but I do wanna make sure that you know that the Navy was involved and the Marines were involved and other airplanes were involved, but the B-52 is the symbol of Linebacker 2. 15 B-52s were lost in combat over North Vietnam. And of these 15 B-52s, if you have a crew of six, sometimes seven, 33 of the B-52 crew were killed in action, 26 uh, B-52 were recovered, and 33 of the B-52 crew became POWs, one of which you get to meet in about three minutes. But the takeaway from this is that Linebacker 2 was a game-changing blow to North Vietnam and it came at a terrific price. You're seeing the price right down there in the black type. And the price of Linebacker 2 was redeemed in the Paris Peace Accords that happened 50 years ago today in January, and plus the return of POWs. So let's look at Colonel Robert Certain. I'll give you a few bullet points about him. Um, he's a native Georgian from Savannah. Uh, graduated from Emory University with a degree in history. Uh, interesting here, there's a lot of history geeks here. Colonel Certain is too. He married his wife, Robbie, six weeks before his second tour in Vietnam. He's the author of the book, The Unchained Eagle, and I'll explain that in a couple seconds here. But he is an expert on post-traumatic stress disorder. Now his book, Unchained Eagle, is really something, if you wanna, wanna read it and get inside the mind of the captive warrior, it's a positive book, but it's a truthful book about the difference between post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress disorder. Think about that if you wanna ask a question, ask him that, he, Colonel Certain likes to explain that. But Colonel Certain flew 99.5 combat missions. Where did the point five come from? Well, obviously his last mission, he didn't get to land, or he did, but he landed in a parachute. He was the navigator on Charcoal One, that's the code sign for, or the call sign for the B-52 he was flying. It was the first B-52G shot down on the first night of Linebacker Two. He spent 101 days as a POW in the Hanoi Hilton system. And then when he came back, he became an Episcopalian priest. He's also a former chaplain of the US Air Force Academy. Bottom line for everybody in this audience, and I'm looking at a bunch of people, this is a rare opportunity to learn from history like I do asking questions of the people who truly experienced it. So please welcome Colonel Robert Certain. Rick? There are people who believe that for the United States, Operation Linebacker II was the most powerful moment in the Vietnam War. 
If you've never heard of it, let me give you the gist. In December of 1972, President Richard Nixon ordered a series of bombing strikes in North Vietnam. And the purpose was to send the message. We're serious, we have the power, and we have the resolve to finally end this thing. And it worked. <laughs> you should check it out. But I have to warn you, the ultimate battlefield of winning or losing a war isn't land, it isn't sea, it isn't sky, and it isn't even outer space. It's the human soul. I'd like to introduce you to Colonel Robert Certain. As a navigator, he directed a most powerful weapon, the B-52G Stratofortress. As a warrior, he flew against the most heavily defended targets on Earth, Hanoi, North Vietnam. As a casualty, he was shot down and he became a prisoner. And then after the war, as a calling, he became an Episcopal priest. And then, as a human being, he went back to war to face the greatest challenge of all, the battle within. Colonel Certain, welcome to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Well, thank you. I'm down here in San Antonio, where it's 61 degrees. I hope you people are keeping warm. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. You look great. Your head is huge. Well, people have said that about me. <laughs> uh, Colonel Certain, we've got questions of a number of people here, but the, the question that I'd like to introduce with you is 50 years ago, January, right now, what were you doing? What were you, describe where you were. Well, somewhere around the middle of January, uh, we were moved, the, the new, the December shootdown guys were moved out of the Hanoi Hilton over to a different prison called, that we call the zoo, the Kulak prison, uh, which was kind of messy from bombing. Uh, and, uh, we cleaned it up and moved from one cell block to another. Uh, and others joined us after we cleaned it up. And so we knew that by then that the North Vietnamese were reordering our, our location by shoot down date. And so everybody that was in the zoo uh, had been down less than about 18 months. And then the, the wounded guys from December and the older prisoners we're over in the Hilton. I got it. I, I got a question for you because what I've learned from being around uh, much of your POW brotherhood is that there was kind of the old guard of POWs and the new guard of POWs. Um, help me understand what, what that meant. I mean, did you, you know, give me a, give me a head around that. Well, you mentioned uh, the bombing hall, the Johnson bombing hall. And so the prisoners that were down before uh, the bombing hall were the old guys. And the ones who came in after uh, bombing resumed in the north and aerial operations resumed in the north were the new guys. So that's the differential. But the other big difference between them was that, uh, according to Admiral Stockdale's book with, that he wrote with Sybil, his wife, called In Love and War, uh, I, I learned that uh, the torture ended when Ho Chi Minh died in 1969. And so the treatment w that we experienced uh, was way different uh, from, the ex from the treatment that the older guys experienced. So describe the treatment. I mean, do you, uh, from the moment you found yourself hanging in your, in your, in your, parachute and you hit North Vietnamese soil. Well, I don't know about describe the treatment, but let's, let's talk about what happened to you. Well, I, I uh, touched down on the edge of a plowed field and rolled, did my parachute landing fall 
roll into a ditch, which ran alongside of a railroad track. Uh, so immediately I could hear people uh, coming in my direction. So I got out of my parachute harness. I broke the antennas off the uh, survival radios and uh, I took off down the ditch looking for a culvert where I could hide for a while. Uh, but they got there before I did. Uh, so uh, as I was preparing to be captured, I still had one radio called up, uh, made a call out that I don't think anybody heard. The charcoal one Delta was on the ground surrounded and being captured. Uh, and then I destroyed that radio. Uh, and then I remembered uh, that I had my Smith & Wesson uh, this is a combat masterpiece six shooter. Uh, fully loaded in my vest, so I pulled it out, int opened the cylinders, ejected the shells, and threw them as far as I could, and then jammed the barrel into the dirt to fill it with dirt so that they couldn't use my weapon to kill me with. And then they spotted me, and uh, I was captured. So when you were when you were captured, uh, I think I, I was talking to somebody here who who had a, a comment. You know, what was the capture like? I mean, were you, was it a, a dramatic moment? Or did you try to flee or did you just give up? I mean, uh, I was surrounded. There were, there were people all the way around me in a big circle, mostly civilians who were none too happy that I dropped in on them unannounced. And there were four militiamen with automatic weapons. So I surrendered, raised my hands. They motioned to me to come up uh, at that moment when they when I was out up. Uh, then they took my flight suit away from me, took it off, they took my boots and my socks, uh, and that was a pretty effective way of searching me to make sure I didn't have any weapons. Uh, of course, it was freezing cold in December that year, and so there I was, you know, without with nothing, no shoes or socks on. In my skivvies, and they tied me, they tied my elbows together, um, and uh, blindfolded me kind of poorly, but blindfolded me, and then uh, started moving me on my foot along the railroad over those on the railroad uh, to a village. And when I was two steps into that, a woman came up behind me with a big one of those big stones. Hit me on the back of the head. The uh, the militia chased her off, helped me get up, and then we they marched me on into that nearest village. It was a kind of a long house, a meeting house of some sort uh, that they took me into. And barricaded the windows, civilians starting to throw things, and uh, started writing things down. They didn't ask me a lot of questions. A nurse came in. Weapon for uh, injuries, offered me a cigarette, a glass of water. And so I thought that was not too bad treatment. And, but uh, for several several times during the, the subsequent movement from there into Hanoi, there were a couple of times when I thought I was going to be executed. Uh, but I was wrong, fortunately. <laughs> yeah, thank the Lord. And uh, we have a question out here. And by the way, Colonel Certain, this is a, a fluid environment. We're gonna, you know, anybody can raise their hand, and I might interrupt uh, a, a question or something that I would have to give preference for somebody in the audience. And there's a woman up front here. Do we have a microphone? The woman up front here has raised her hand, and she'd like to ask a question. First of all, I'd like to say welcome home. Thank you for your service. What was the mentality you had to maintain to get through day by day of your experience as a POW? Do you have a daily mantra or? Well, yeah, the, the thing, of course, we had the code of conduct that we all memorized earlier in our career and knowing what we had to do, next, what, what was expected of of conduct. Uh, it was, we were not, I was only isolation one night. And on night two, another 52 crew member 
second airplane that went down uh, was placed in the cell with me so we could communicate. Communicating and checking details, checking what we do was important. And and so one of the things we had probably did was keep in mind, first of all, my faith, and secondly, my family at home and what they must be going through, because I knew what I was going through, but I knew that my family had no clue. And the, day, the second day, uh, we were taken in front of the International Press Corps with pictures taken, and when I saw all those Europeans with cameras, uh, I made sure they all had a chance to get a good photograph my face and both sides of my face. Uh, and I knew that once they hit the water surface, uh, that I would be going home eventually, and that my family would know that I was alive. In fact, that photograph showed up on the page of the Washington Post the very next day. And uh, my parents, my wife, my siblings, all those folks were able to see it and were notified uh, within a short period of time. <clears throat> notified that I was missing in action until I was certified as a prisoner of war was a matter of hours, not days, months, and weeks. Days, weeks, and months. Wow. Yeah. Colonel Certain, <clears throat> excuse me, Colonel Certain, my name is Steve Buckland. Uh, from one veteran to another, I appreciate your service, not only during active duty, but what you've done with PTS and PTSD. Right, and, and for helping us learn. So I've got, I've got a couple of questions, if, if you'll indulge me. One, one of my great privileges as a history professor was to interview Bud Day uh, for a collection of oral histories. Did you know Bud? Yes, of course. Yeah, uh, and, and your stories are very similar because Bud emphasized his faith getting him through his experience as a POW. Yeah, you know, Bud, Bud has a remarkable POW story, and, and when he passed, it was, it was a sad day. Absolutely. So one of my questions, and it really is beyond, I think, the purview of, of the Vietnam War, but it's one of the consequences. And that consequence was that after the Vietnam War, we went to an all-volunteer military. Do you think that's been good for the young people of the United States? Uh, no. No, you know, there's a couple of things that I disagree with, and, and the all-voluntary military is, is one of them because that means that the military is all professionals, and I think uh, the citizen soldier that we had known since the colonial period Till the end of the Vietnam War was important because people came in uh, for a short period of time under the draft and then knew that they'd be released at the end of the they found it to be what they wanted as a career. Uh, now when you come in, coming in basically uh, for, for a career, and what, anymore what we have is family business. The multi-generations of people serving I laud that they're serving and laud the, the active duty military. I think that, that it's tempered better people who are there and they don't really want to be there. Thank you, Colonel. I'm going to say one, one thing that I'd, I'd like to ask you is you when you brought up about um, your family. How did Wabi, your wife, learn of your shoot down and that you were safe? Well, that was another one of those tragic stories. I was shot down the day I was scheduled to go home. So she was preparing to receive me home that night. Uh, she, she was in her hometown. She was from Blyville, Arkansas, where I had been stationed. Uh, we had married just six weeks before I was deployed. Actually, we thought I was going to leave the next day, uh, and I was delayed. Uh, and then I was scheduled to come home on the 18th of December. That, that schedule was canceled on the 15th. But I didn't call home because of operational security. Uh, so what happened was that 
the the commander at Hawaii Air Force Base uh, called the furniture store that her father operated. Uh, they learned about my shooting at noon and told the, the salesman to get in touch with him and tell him to wait at the house and somebody would come by to see him. Well, that's always kind of bad. Robbie had, was teaching first grade, kindergarten there in Blyville. And so she was at, at her parents' house for lunch. And so uh, they were a little bit anxious. And then as uh, the, the, the nightmare for, military, for Air Force spouses was when a white top staff car uh, showed up in front. Blue, be- blue body, a white roof. Then senior officers started, including commanders, flight surgeons, and chaplains. And that pretty much tells you this. Uh, so that first they came in and, and told her that I was missing in action uh, over North Vietnam and she, boy, and she thought, what the heck? He's a navigator. He knows better than to fly. Um, and uh, besides that, I was supposed to phone home. The, uh, but then within uh, just a few hours, because that picture had been taken and North Vietnamese had released names and service numbers, uh, then my name was, while it was mispronounced, service number was correct uh, on the news. And so they certified that I was, in fact, a prisoner of war. That there was some delay, first notifica- notification, because we changed, we had been scheduled to take off as one position, and we actually took off two airplanes in front of our original schedule. And then any time there was a problem with the uh, flight, airplanes could change position before they got to the target. And so they had to wait over eight hours for all those B-52s to get back to Guam to make sure they knew exactly which crew was missing. Uh, and then they then they started notifying uh, the families. Is, uh does Bobby, uh, Robbie, is she around? I mean, uh, or she, uh, you don't want to have to holler at her, but. <laughs> She's next door. She's next door visiting a neighbor. Well, if, if she were here, how would she describe what uh, she was feeling when she finds out, okay, her husband is not coming home? Well, you know, obviously pretty upset when she first heard it because she was fully anticipating that I'd be home that night. Uh, and uh, and then, then it was uh, one, of, one of those uh, bargaining with God transitions into uh, pray, praying for my safe return and, and being willing to, uh, to do whatever came next in our career uh, if I came home safely. Or, as I said, fortunately, school was out for Christmas break that day, or the day before, that was a Monday. The 18th was a Monday, so they had gotten out on the Friday before on the 15th. So she had some time off from school and teaching uh, to kind of get her head together with this. Uh, and uh, so she talked, obviously talked with the parents. She went, she flew to Atlanta uh, to, to meet up with my family down there. And my oldest brother had worked with WB Television in Atlanta to uh, do a private screening of the video of that news conference where uh, I, I was taken in front of the, 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 the um, photographers, but I didn't say anything, but at least she could see my face uh, as I uh, uh, walked in front of them. And uh, and then I walked away, and so she knew that that I I was I could walk. She knew that I seemed okay. I was not happy, but she was able to see that. And uh, so the family was was in a glum mood down in Atlanta. My parents, my my oldest brother and his family, my number two brother, I think, and his family, my sister and her family, my number three brother. Uh, was flying KC-135 Strato tankers in Southeast Asia. He actually saw me get shot down, uh, and uh, so he refused to come home until 
treaty was signed and, and the first POWs were released. Wait, wait a second. We've got questions here, but I want okay. you to articulate that. But real quick, your brother saw you get shot down? Yes. He was, he was flying a refueling orbit over the Gulf of Tonkin, which was 90 miles from Hanoi. Uh, but when a B-52 gets lit up uh, with about 150,000 pounds of jet fuel on board, uh, it's, a bright, it's a bright fire. And he saw the airplane go down. He didn't know it was mine at the time. He learned that the next day when he got at his base back at Takli. Just as an anecdote to the audience, uh, I, I was part of a production of a film on Colonel Certain, and we found what we believe to be is the shoot down of his B-52. And when he talks about the bright flame of all that fire spinning down, hitting the ground, it's... Um, you can see how a KC-135 or Stratotanker in, in 90 miles away could see that bright fire and burning. We have a, do we have a question out here? Um, yes, sir. Uh, Colonel uh, Certain John Erpenbach, I had to thank you for your uh, service. A uh, question in um, Early 70s, mid 70s, uh, PTSD wasn't even recognized as a diagnosis for by psychiatry yet. We had shell shock and battle fatigue, etc. And uh, you have become somewhat of an expert on it. Were you one of the first groups that kind of muddled through as far as treatment, or one of those that refined it? Uh, speak about that, if you would, please. Well, we came home, and I thought you know, my own attitude was that I wasn't. I was not a real Vietnam veteran because I was never on the ground. Uh, I was not a real POW because I was only there for 100 days and it was after the torture ended. And within uh, a month of being captured, I knew I was going home. And six weeks into it, I knew when I would go. Uh, and so I never thought about it. And then I went to seminary when the Air Force sent me to seminary when I came home and I became a chaplain. I didn't adapt well to the Air Force chaplaincy, and that was probably part of the issue. Uh, and then it was through a course of about oh, 10 years into it, I, I, really, I would always had trouble around just before Christmas. And I would stay a little bit you know, upset and tense and from, until Easter. And I, I was home 10 years before I put together that those were the bookends for my Got down a week before uh, Christmas, and I came home a week before Holy Week. And so then I was said, "Okay, well, if that makes it, if that if that story is what's rattling my, then I should back away from some of the activity as a as a, an Episcopalian because Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, and Easter big seasons." Uh, so I did some, started doing some. Uh, but I, the other thing that I was, it would happen though, I also did a lot of captain stewardship drives to raise a lot of money for all the parishes that I served. And every time, as we closed in on the test at the end of the day, I would be sending out resumes looking for what to live. And so that's when the doctor at uh, Pensacola Naval Air Station following all the POWs, said, I think you've got PTS, and so you need to check into this kind of therapy. And I looked it up two years later, and uh, I've also had started writing, I've written the first part of the book, uh, the war story part, and uh, I uh, looked into EMDR therapy, found a therapist nearby, 60 miles away, and, and got into it. And what I learned was that all that experience was thematically similar, not to being a prisoner of war, but to the events of that final mission. Uh, and, uh, and so anytime thematically events occur in the sort of same sequence, same importance as that mission, uh, then I would only have one option for what I was going to do. And uh, that's why I was sending out resumes towards the end of a successful campaign because it was a 
Uh, and, you know, that mission, came to that mission, we, first of all, we didn't want to go because we weren't. Secondly, we had changing positions. We had earth tremor on Guam before we took off. We had a mechanical problem when we took off that we had to resolve. We had other flight planning, mission-oriented concerns that we had to resolve. And my job as the navigator was to make sure we got to the target ex on time, exactly to the second on time. And that's what we did. And uh, and then 10 seconds before uh, bomb release, we had the bomb base open. And then we got hit by a first of two surface air missiles. And uh, while we dropped the bomb, we also ejected within seconds of bomb release. Uh, and, uh, and so there it went. So EMDR therapy was enabled me to develop new options and different options for living my life. Uh, and that, that was not until 1998, about the time I retired from the Air Force Reserve. And certainly, you've, uh, you've taught me the difference between PTS and PTSD. Would well, you explain that? All of us, you know, almost all of us, many of us have post-traumatic, we have traumatic incidents in our life. They can be all kinds of incidents. They can be car wrecks. They can be uh, burglary, home burglaries. They can be the loss of a child, the loss of a spouse. And those are all traumatic. And, and after that, then we have post-traumatic stress and issues. Uh, my mother used to talk about her father that I never knew because her parents were dead before I was born. But her mother had died first. And she told me that Papa would take to bed about the same time of the year when his, when his wife died. And then uh, they would, once he got past that for a while, then he would get up and go back to the farm and work. But And then he died about the same time his wife had died same time of the year as his wife died. So, you know, we, we do these things. Rhonda Cornum, who was a flight surgeon in Desert Storm, was shot down, captured, and killed there, uh, was with the Army's uh, Soldier Resiliency Program. And when I was with the Defense Health Board, and she talked about post-traumatic growth. You know, there, there are all kinds of experiences. Post-traumatic, some people just learn the, uh, lessons and they grow spiritually, psychologically, physically, and, and are able to incorporate uh, those experiences into their, into their life. I like to think that I, part of what I did was to do that so that I, and I was more empathetic as a clergyman with uh, parishioners who were going through divorces, bad jobs, and, and other traumas in their lives. And then there's, there's with uh, in the declining side, there's self-correction, like the, the uh, bookends understanding that I came to after 10 years, uh, where, where you say, oh, my goodness, that's, you know, that's in the background of long, once upon a time long, long ago, but it's affecting me today. And so I need to do something to keep that from happening and, and grow. Dis the D stands for dysfunction. And, and so when it gets to the dysfunction stage, that's when you really need uh, pro professional, uh, psychological, psychiatric, sometimes medical uh, cures and back to, to learn to, to grow out of that, to, to grow from that, and to recover. And so that, those, it's just like a spectrum of, of diseases. You know, I, I, a seasonal cold is one thing. COVID-19 is, you know, both of them are COVID viruses, but COVID-19 has been much worse than the seasonal cold or the flu. Right. Now, we've got questions out here, but I, I want to let people know what this young gentleman is doing when he hands out a question or uh, something to somebody who's asked a question. This is a, a challenge coin. <clears throat> and... This challenge coin was produced by the Distinguished Flying Cross Society and the old guys in the airplanes group 
to commemorate the podcast series that was produced of which Colonel Certain and his wife, Robbie, played a role. So just letting everybody know what these little kind of little gifts that are being being passed around. The challenge coins are a, a tradition of fraternal organizations, kind of a memento in every old guys in airplanes production. Uh, we make a challenge coin. So if you get one of these, you can Google Linebacker 2 Libraries podcast, and you can learn more about uh, the linebacker operation in detail. But we have another question uh, from the audience. Yes. Uh, I also served over there, but in the Army on the ground. And uh, you talked about PTSD. We deal and are still dealing with Agent Orange. Do you have any knowledge, and can you enlighten us a little bit on that? Well, the Agent Orange saga has been going on since, since the war. I was years ago, in the early 80s, I was on the advisory board of Judge Weinstein, of the District Court of New Eastern New York, who was overseeing the settlement, the distribution of the $180 million settlement, which you look back on it, that was like nothing. Uh, and uh, and so so I got involved with, with that at the time. And then over the years, uh, the VA started out by saying there are no ill effects from Agent Orange exposure, uh, except for a couple of minor diseases. They resisted uh, accepting any presumptive or any responsibility on the part of the government for for long-term effects. Now, that's changed a lot over the years uh, so that not only are there a variety of acknowledged medical conditions associated with, with Agent Orange, but the, the places where it was used, it wasn't just used in South Vietnam. It wasn't just used in South Vietnam and Cambodia. It was used around military bases, Air Force bases, uh, throughout the, the theater in both Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, uh, as well as on Guam, uh, to clear uh, the, <coughs> excuse me, to clear the foliage around the runways and taxiways. Uh, and so they, only in the last couple of years have they included that, and also uh, the spread of the, the, the spray into, uh, into the deep water Navy area so that, that that people who in the Navy uh, who were actually offshore were also affected by <coughs> by the the, the uh, element. So it's been a long struggle. It's fifty years later, and uh, I'm not sure that it's over. We have another question. But I'll tell you one thing. Let me just say. Look up in the VA presumptives for uh, Agent Orange exposure and locations because that's on their website. And if you have any of those conditions, you and you in the Army, of course, walk through the jungles with that, and you didn't, and you got all over your body and, and into your food and everything else. Then you need to go to make sure you get a VA protocol physical uh, and and explain to them what you have, and why you think is Agent Orange related. Colonel Certain, thanks for uh, doing this today. Uh, my name is Ben Jones, and uh, it's an honor to speak to you. I, I'm struck by the fact that you were wrote, you were scheduled to go home, and instead you got on a P-52 and flew a combat mission. Right. Um, what was the mindset in the ready room, not only of yourself but your crew and the rest of the crews as they were all of a sudden launched? How much notice did you have that this was going to be an attack? And, uh, and that kind of thing. Well, on Friday the 15th, uh, all rotations were suspended. All f combat missions taking off on Saturday and Sunday uh, were canceled. And the crews were told to get into crew rest, which meant take a relaxing period, don't drink any alcohol, uh, eat well, sleep well, and get ready uh, for a mission briefing on Monday. So we knew that, you know, we were we were tense. 
uh, we, the war was o- either over and we were going home or the war was going to end uh, over there and we were going to fly combat. Uh, I called the ske- I called the scheduling officer and I said, you know, I don't know what's going on, but this crew had, is, was scheduled to go home. We, are, we had maximum flight hours for the month. And so if there's any way you can postpone us until a few days later, that would be helpful. That didn't happen. Um, and so when we walked into the mission briefing, instead of about nine guys in there, it was jam-packed full of people. The squadron commander came out, you know, something out of a movie, pulled the curtain. Our target for today is, and, and the, the triangle was around the city of Hanoi, Hanoi, North Vietnam. And then we all just kind of went, oh, dear. Two things. One is, oh, that's, that's dangerous because we knew it was so heavily defended by surface-to-air missiles and we were a, a fairly slow-moving airplane, and we were going to go in at high altitudes, so thirty thousand feet and above, uh, and we were going to go in like elephant walk, one mile separation between airplanes, twenty-seven airplanes in a row, uh, from the same heading, at the same within a thousand feet of the same altitude, and uh, against the target. And then we were going to make a steep turn, which blanked out our east, our electronic countermeasures, and go back and turn our nose then into a tail, into a jet stream headwind. Now, and, and so we'd slow down uh, like 180 knots in the turn, and we'd be in the SAM threat zone for another 15 minutes after that. Uh, so it just didn't look like the smart thing to do. Uh, I was, you know, my... Our profession at Strategic Air Command was nuclear war, and our ta- our st- strategy and tactics called for extreme low level operation and not high altitude, so that you could fly under the radar, and, and you'd be crossing over land so fast at low altitude that they didn't have time to shoot at you. Uh, but so we went in. We thought it was crazy, and we didn't like it. Uh, and then they did the same, exact same routes at the exact same time the next night and the next night. And they lost, second night, I don't think they lost anybody, but the third night, there was, I think it was four. So it was three on the first night, although one of them got away, uh, got out of the area, and they were rescued after they had to eject from the airplane. But that was over Thailand. Two crews went down the first night, uh, and we had... Two, three off of my crew and four off the next crew that survived it. Uh, and, uh, and then, you know, it was just, it was a lot of noise. But there was over 750 B-52 missions against Hanoi in those 11 nights. And uh, 15 airplanes were knocked down. Uh, only 10 over the city. The other five got away and got into Thailand or South Vietnam or over the ocean you know, with the crews rescued. Uh, and the others all got back to safe landings either in Thailand or on Guam. Uh, so that was a lot of effort and quite successful. Uh, and uh, as John had said in his introduction, uh, the next thing was that after 11 nights of that, uh, the North Vietnamese government was ready to sign whatever document they needed to to get, get, uh, get the war over so that they could uh, take a respite and get ready to to go into South Vietnam within the next two years. All right. We have a lot of questions here. So in the, in the yellow August in the sweatshirt. And then uh, behind you and the, the guy in the red. The yellow Augie sweatshirt and then the guy in the red behind after that. I've watched uh, Ken Burns, Vietnam, because... I turned 18 in 1973, uh, so I didn't have to get a number. So I tried to learn as much as I could. And if we, we lost 58,000 in the war, and then how were how many POWs and how were they released? Were they traded like we trade with Russia for somebody? And then 
you can, you can answer what you want because some of these might be relevant and some might not. But uh, what were the strengths? There is North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, Viet Cong. Are all those three separate? And which ones were hard to train or which ones were better equipped? And did anything like that have to do with uh, supplies? Uh, I remember the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Was that a big part of the success of getting supplies in? And you can answer any of those. Well, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was a net dirt roads, basically. Uh, that got, it was fairly wide and fairly complicated and, and went down through Laos and into Cambodia and South Vietnam. And so there's a lot of interdiction efforts to, to stop that. The, North Vietnamese were being supplied by rail out of China and uh, ship out of Russia. Um, the, uh, the, there were over 500 of us prisoners of war Americans. Now, when the treaty was signed on the 29th of January, the, the terms of that was that all prisoners on both sides would be released over the periodically every, every other week for the next uh, 60 days. So the, the treaty was signed the 29th of January. The first release was mid-February. Uh, C-141s came in to pick them up. The next one was the 1st of March, in the middle of March, and then the end of March. Uh, and, the, and in that, and the Americans held in South Vietnam were released, I think at the same time, uh, in the middle of all of that, they, those were mostly Army and a few Marine Corps. Um, and then we had two guys in China uh, that were released also uh, through uh, Korea, North Korea, to South, and into South Korea. So we had, uh, so it was not exactly a swap. It was an agreement to stop hostilities and to repatriate uh, the warriors on both sides. We have uh, another question here, sir. Uh, Colonel, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit up about your interreaction with your fellow POWs in the Hanoi Hilton, and uh, was there ever any uh, discussion or thought of escape or rescue? No. <laughs> no. Well, we, the Hilton was right in the center of town, basically, so, you know, we couldn't pass for locals. There was one escape uh, out of Hanoi from the zoo, uh, but they were captured within 24 hours, and one of the three men was been brutally uh, killed by the, by the prison uh, officials uh, when they recaptured. Uh, the, and the, so the rule was that was instituted was there would be no further escape attempts uh, unless there was. Uh, Assistance from the outside. That is, there was a rescue team on the outside ready to. Uh, the only the other one that was attempted rescue was Sante, uh, the prisons outside of Hanoi, uh, and unfortunately, those prisoners had been moved to another camp five miles away when the Sante raiders came in, and the, and so some people thought that the Sante raid was a failure, but what happened was it so upset the North Vietnamese uh, that they moved almost all the prisoners from those outlying camps into the three prisons inside the city. The, the Hanoi Hilton, the, the Wailo prison, a prison we call the Plantation, uh, and the, the one we call the Zoo. Uh, there was still one prison still operating up on the China border, uh, and those guys didn't know about linebacker too until they were brought in city after, uh, after the treaty was signed. And so they came back and at the end of January and, and uh, saw the rubble and the, we had been as B-52s, uh, but uh, they, they, were, they were told after uh, that it was over. Colonel Certain, it's, uh, our, our time is about up, but I have uh, one last question to ask you. As a, a Vietnam veteran, and um, especially with your status of, of being a part of such a critical time of the end of the Vietnam War, 
how would you like future generations to remember your generation? Well, I have a you know wing commander. There was a longtime friend of mine after I came. He was a wing commander when I went to Anderson. And he was a World War II veteran. And uh, he said the greatest generation was not World War II. Uh, because almost everybody that went to Vietnam for the first several years were volunteers. Uh, you know, the, the draftees didn't get sent in very big numbers until after around 68, 69, uh, and uh, after Tet. Uh, and so we were volunteers. Uh, we were better educated uh, than, uh, than uh, World War II or Korea because those, you know, World War II was so massive and so critical uh, that most able-bodied men got called up uh, and, and sent to war. Korea were, were basically you know, that, that, the forgotten war, uh, tragic time, but uh, they were poorly equipped. And so we, we learned, the Department of Defense learned from the Korean experience to train us for uh, interrogation resistance and survival much better than, than our Korean counterparts. Uh, I don't know that I would call us the, the, the even greater uh, generation, but but we came back and we, while we were, you know, the the, the army, particularly the Marine Corps, they came home. They were not treated well uh, after about 1967, and were spat on and, and called baby killers and couldn't get. It. They told, you know, put Vietnam service in their resume. They couldn't get a job, and so, uh, they, but they they persevered and. and uh, Came back to, to contribute greatly, I think, to uh, the well-being of this nation. So I would hope that that future generations will actually study our own history from the colonial period all the way through, and not just write off any of our our conflict periods uh, as unfortunate news, uh, but study why why the politicians. Felt it was necessary for us to go. What we did when we conducted the war, it wasn't all me lie in Vietnam. There were a lot of orphans, orphanages built. There were children saved, uh, hospitals built. There was infrastructure done, uh, and and you know the American warrior, uh, as much a civil engineer and a social engineer as they have been, uh, people at the pointy end of the stick that go out to kill people and break things. We, we also hate to, to do that, and so we, we also put things back together. Colonel Certain, uh, I think I speak for everybody in the audience. Thank you for making yourself available, and uh, we wish you well, and I uh, want to give you a South Dakota round of applause for, for showing up. Thank you. Thank you.